So this third example from our slides, when we first glance at it, it probably looks like a chapter four problem and kind of looks a little bit messier than the previous two. But what we'll see is that it's not really any more uh, effort or setup than the previous two problems. There's just gonna be a little more care and time that we put into the work term. And the reason for that is because out of everything that happens in a chapter seven problem, the most common place that I see students make mistakes, that we see students make mistakes every semester, is in the work term. And the most common place that they make that mistake is in the um, angle. Because in the textbook, the work term is force times distance times cosine of theta. And if we don't understand what the textbook thinks that theta means, then we're gonna plug in the wrong angle sometimes. And when we see this example where there's a ramp angle and there's also the angle of the force, we might get confused on which one we're supposed to put in. But what I need us to understand is that there should never ever be confusion if we are using the other version of the work term that we've been talking about, which is thinking about force in the direction of motion times distance. That one tries to make sure that we don't get confused in that same way. And if we just rely on the book term because we're plugging in numbers, um, we are going to make mistakes and that's a problem for us. So we're going to try to use that more concept based format of it, which is force in the direction of motion times distance. Okay. So we can start out by drawing the situation. So we have a ramp here. And we're told that it is 0.4 meters tall, that the ramp is 1.2 meters across. And although we're told the 18.4 degrees in the small um, text on the picture, that's just what the angle needs to make these nice, simple numbers. So now that we already have the height and the distance, we don't have to worry about that. Now we are told that the block starts at rest, so the initial velocity is zero, but we are pulling with a force of 20 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees the two kilogram mass starts at rest. And our goal for this problem is to figure out what that final velocity is gonna be of the two kilogram mass. Okay, so right now we can see that just like in our previous two problems, what we want to do is identify what we mean by before. So here when it's not moving is our before. And we want to identify what we mean by after. Here with this unknown velocity, that's our after at the top of the ramp. And the other thing that we want to note is we have this before and we have this after. We also see that there's this force here at an angle. That means that we are going to have a work term. When we get to that point, we're going to realize that we have energy being added to this system because someone is pulling this block up the ramp. Okay, so we can always kind of make our um, setup as organized as possible by writing out the before and after table that we've started to see in places where we're asking about kinetic energy and we're asking about potential energy from gravity and right now, in our slide so far, those are the only ones that we have. We'll also be talking about springs eventually, but there's no springs here either. And then we also want to know if there's a work term. So there is going to be a work term because of the pull force. Force is not the same thing as work. The work term is not just the 20, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so kinetic energy at the start of the problem. We don't have any kinetic energy at the start of the problem. Because if we look, we started at rest. Are we moving? The answer would be no at the start of the problem. At the end of the problem, we are moving. 
It's never meant to be a trick question. We are being asked to find that speed. So even if we're not quite sure whether we're moving or not, that's the unknown. And so we know that that term has to exist. Otherwise, we've got nothing to solve for. At the beginning of the problem, we ask ourselves, are we higher than we are at other points in the problem? And the answer is no. At the beginning of the problem, we're at the bottom of the ramp. At the end of the problem, in the after column, we can ask ourselves, are we higher than at other points in the problem? And yes, we are. We're at the top of the ramp. We have M, G, H. Okay, so if we look, we can write out our equation. So energy before plus work added equals energy after. So in the energy before column, we look and we see that we have zero plus zero. And so even if we weren't quite sure about the work term, if we start with no energy, it has to be coming from somewhere. And so it comes from that work term. And we're just going to write out the word work before we continue. And then in the after column, we have one half mv squared plus mgh. And those are the two terms that we have in the after column. Now, I'm going to erase this so that I can start to talk about the work term before we get too far down the board. So if you need to pause the video because you haven't finished writing it down, that's perfectly fine. I won't be offended. Uh, and so I'm going to, last chance, just kidding, you can rewind. Okay, we are going to look in a little bit more detail at that work term so that instead of continuing without understanding of what that term is, we actually know what number we can plug in there. Now, like I said before we started writing on the um, board, the best way to think about the work term is the way that we talked about it in the slides. Force in the direction of motion times distance. Okay, now what that means is the piece of force that is in the direction of motion along the ramp is found by taking the 20 newton force times the cosine of 30 degrees. Because this particular along the ramp component of the force, thinking back to vectors in chapters 3 and 4, the component along the ramp is the cosine. And then the distance is the 1.2 meters along the ramp. It isn't this unknown distance along the flat because that's not the um, direction that that object is going. It is going a full 1.2 meters. So when we plug in all of that, and this is just the work term, we will get 20.8 joules. We are adding that much energy to the system. So when we continue now um, below, and I'll make this go up a bit, when we continue now below, we can plug that 20.8 joules in. Then we can plug in all the other numbers. This is a two kilogram block, our unknown velocity squared, plus two times 9.8 times the height here, we hadn't listed it already. The height is 0.4 times 0.4. Okay, so we have 20.8. One half times two is one, so we have v squared here. And then when we plug all this in, two times 9.8 times 0.4, we get 7.84. So we'll subtract that from both sides. So we will get 12.96 equals v squared. Not um, finished with the problem quite yet. We're going to take the square root of both sides so that we can get v all by itself. And we will get that v equals 3.6 meters per second. 
So 3.6 meters per second is our um, speed at the top of the ramp. Now, a quick aside, we could have done this problem in chapter four. It would have been a long problem. We would have had to start with a force diagram. We would have had to look at all of the forces in the direction of motion, which would have been the component of our pull force up the ramp and our component of gravity down the ramp. Now gravity is slowing us down the ramp. The way that that shows up in our energy problem is we have to spend energy in the gravity term. Instead of speeding it up, we have to split that energy into speeding it up and fighting against gravity. Then once we did all of the forces, we would get the net force, we would get the acceleration of the block. And then after all of that chapter four work, we would have to plug that in to um, the kinematics equations from chapter two for that particular acceleration, for that distance, what the final speed would be. And we would end up with 3.6 meters per second. So we can have done, we could have done this problem, and we've done similar ones back in chapter four, but the energy problem is significantly simpler and shorter. And so energy techniques are really powerful. They can just only answer a subset of um, situations, but they are really, really useful for us when we can keep track of the energy easily in kinetic energy terms and gravity terms. So that's the example uh, number three or 7C, and I'll see you in the next one.